Why did I get involved in research in the first place? I was uh, I was in a course in freshman biology, and I didn't know exactly what I wanted to do. I always told myself and told everybody else I'd go to medical school or dental school, but I didn't really know. I just interested in science, and I was in basic biology, and the professor gave an example of this worm crawling across this guy's eye, and he was really good about giving examples and saying, if you're interested in this, then you need to take Professor so-and-so's course. And so he did that, and I said, I want to take that course. And by the time I was a sophomore, I had already been given the keys to the lab, and I was doing my first research project. And it just sort of sparked an interest in parasites. And then it evolved into the most important parasite that we have is malaria, and I had that opportunity to work on malaria. Of course, Dr. Kyle wasn't just interested in researching malaria. My, my passion before research was sports. I played baseball in college, and anything I could do with sports, you know, spring, summer, fall, that's all I did when I was a kid. And so it's sort of combining. In fact, I combined my two passions when I did my first research project. It was fishing and parasites. So I did parasites of fish, and I went and caught the fish and did the parasite studies. So really, it, it just sort of evolved from knowing that you can't do sports all your life, and I knew I wasn't going to be Johnny Bench, uh, which I was a catcher. So I decided that, that uh, I would follow my interest. I wanted to do something that was exciting, made me get up in the morning and want to go to work, and that's what led me to research. Dennis E. Kyle majored in biology at the University of Tennessee at Chattanooga and completed a Ph.D. in zoology at Clemson University. Following a postdoctoral position at the University of Georgia, he began a 21-year association with the Walter Reed Army Institute of Research. During this time, he led key efforts with the U.S. Army's drug and vaccine development programs, eventually serving as deputy director of the Division of Experimental Therapeutics. During this period, he also served as the chief department of immunology and parasitology at the Armed Force Research Institute of Medical Sciences in Bangkok, Thailand and was a senior scientist in the malaria drug program at the Australian Army Malaria Institute from January 2002 through June 2004. When asked about his passion for parasites, Dr. Kyle had this to say. When you're working on a disease as important as malaria, you can find inspiration in almost everything. I, I think the real inspiration comes from when you see, you know, somebody dying of a disease and you know that you can actually maybe impact somebody in the future from dying from that disease by the work that you're doing, that should be inspiration enough. And that's, that's really what uh, I've been able to, to use. That being able to work in endemic countries where malaria is prevalent and seeing it firsthand, that's the, the biggest inspiration I have. Um, USF really encourages their students to be involved in research kind of at an early age. And I think that seeing people like Dr. Kyle really inspires you that, you know, he gives you an example of how research can make a difference. He, his research, he's accomplished a lot with it, and who knows what he'll accomplish in the future, and it kind of gives me that drive. It kind of reminds me that research isn't just a semester-long project or a year-long project. You know, it's a lifelong project if you want it to be. As much as Dr. Kyle shares his inspiration with others, he also acknowledges that there are difficulties in working in the lab. There are always frustrations. I, I think the, you know, the way that Research has gone in the past 20 years. There's increasing oversight. The, that's the frustration, but there's nothing really that's ever derailed me from, from my enthusiasm for research. I mean, when I get up in the morning, I, you know, I still get a tingly feeling when I can walk into a room with my student and they've discovered something that nobody else has ever done for the first time. It may not be earth shattering at all, but you know, just having an experimental result that the first time anybody ever sees it, you and your student, that, that still is exciting even today, and that's what, that's what helps me come to work every day and, and forget about the frustrations. Public enemy number one, Anopheles, the malaria mosquito, wanted.
for willful spreading of disease and theft of working hours, for bringing sickness and misery to untold millions in many parts of the world. Okay, well, malaria is still even a complex disease. There are five different species of malaria that infect people. Uh, the, there's two most common ones that we mostly work on is Plasmodium falciparum and Plasmodium vivax. Plasmodium falciparum is the one we know the most about because we can actually grow it in the laboratory. We can do lots of studies with it in the lab and in the field. And it's also probably the most important because it's the one that results in the most mortality and morbidity in the world. When the mosquito bites you, the first stage of infection in all the malaria species is the infected form goes from the mosquito bite through your body into the liver. Most malaria parasites will immediately grow in your liver and then leave the liver and go into the bloodstream where they cause the symptoms of malaria. And when you, we talk about trying to eradicate or eliminate malaria, which is our ultimate goal now, most of our drugs only work against the blood stages, the ones that cause the symptoms of malaria. We don't have really good drugs to work on the liver stages, and those parasites sleeping in the liver are almost immune to most of the things that we use to try to control malaria. So we can be very effective. We can go into an area of, of Thailand or Cambodia and get rid of most of the malaria, but if that parasite comes back from the liver, then it's almost like you're starting over again. So from an elimination of malaria standpoint, which is the real uh, driving force for our community right now, we have to be able to understand that parasite. And we can't even grow the parasite in the laboratory continuously. We can't model the liver stages of the infection well to be able to even study the next new drug or the next new vaccine. So that's why we're being funded by the Gates Foundation here at, at USF, is to advance both of those fields. There's plenty of really interesting biology that you can do that may have a direct impact. So I'm not saying other people's work is not important, but this sort of what we call translational research, basically doing work, work in the lab that has almost immediate impact in the field, that's the kind of interface that I like to be at. Your goals in our, our lab, under general goals, one would be to discover a new drug that will help uh, prevent transmission and uh, relapses in, uh, of malaria and that's a very complex series of, of projects but basically is to discover a new drug and develop it and we have one that's going forward now we started about two and a half years ago and we're going to the final stages of maybe even going into clinical trials in a couple of years so that's been very successful so that's one major area the other area is one of my pet areas of research is trying to understand how the parasite becomes resistant to a drug. This is the major drawback of all of our drugs. The parasite gets exposed to it, it evolves mutations or other ways to handle the drug so that it's no longer effective, and then you've spent 20 years trying to develop a drug and now it's no longer any good. And our lab developed the very first in vitro resistant parasites in the lab, and now we have parasites from these people that have failed or resistant and we're studying those at the sort of the parasite level and the chemical biology level and that's probably as exciting as anything we have going on. So this is a very important parasite right here. You, you I see can't you show can, everybody. But so you can, can figure it. out what genes it is that are causing the resistance, Exactly. Right? We're trying to understand the mechanism for resistance in this parasite. If we knew the mechanism of resistance in this little bug right here, we could be able to solve a huge problem that we're about to have with malaria. And it's just little experiments like this that we can do in our lab growing this parasite to be able to study that. Dr. Kyle knows that malaria affects many parts of the world and considers himself lucky to be able to travel. I've been fortunate to be able to interact with people from all over the world. Uh, that opens your eyes into not only, you know, the little hometown you may have grown up in and the values that you had there to comparing that to a small town in Thailand, it's amazing how similar those values can be and how, you know, I, I can think of people where I grew up with and the closest analog I have to somebody who was very similar to that personality-wise and et cetera 
is somebody in Thailand. And, you know, you wouldn't think that if you didn't have those experiences. And I Dr. Kyle also shared one of his traveling experiences from when he went to Uganda. We were, I was invited there as part of a team to help. Most of the studies that were going on were with HIV. But then the people there kept asking, can we have somebody who works on malaria come in and help us? Because that's, that's equally important for them. And so I was invited in to sort of give some expertise. And we were walking through from one part of the village to another. And we were walking down this little dirt road. And everywhere you could see, as far as you could see, were bananas. It was a, basically a banana plantation. And it was grown by the local people. So we were walking down this dirt road, nobody in sight. And we walk around a the corner, and there's this little girl on the side of the road selling bananas. And I don't remember how much it was. It may have been five cents for a huge batch of these little small bananas. And so we had four or five of us, and we gave the girl the money, and we each ate one, and then there were four or five left. And so we gave them back to the little girl, and in like 30 seconds, she ate three of them. And I was sitting there thinking to myself, you know, she's sitting here in the middle of this big banana plantation, and she's so poor that she can't even eat what she's sitting here on the side of the road trying to sell. So we took this little girl, we followed her, we had an interpreter who was local. We followed her down the, down the road to where she was living, and she was living on the side of this road with her mom and her little brother. Her mom was HIV positive, and they were living in a lean-to, basically. It was a little mud sort of thing with a you know, small pot on the side where she would cook. There was no protection from mosquitoes, and her dad had died of HIV. She had a sibling die of malaria before, and it just sort of hits home what exactly is important about the disease you're working on. When you see how poor these people are and how much they're suffering from these diseases, it just makes you want to do something. How does traveling to these places affect your research? It's critical. It, you know, you really, if you're working on a, on a problem that we're, you have to go where the problem is, and if it's tropical medicine, most of that is, is overseas. So uh, I thought I knew quite a lot about malaria because I had my PhD in parasitology. I'd been studying for several years. Then when I moved to Thailand, I figured out how much I did not know about malaria that I wouldn't have learned if I hadn't seen it and worked directly with people that saw it every day. So that was, it was imperative that I, I have those experiences. And it really has flavored significantly the kind of research and my interest levels ever since. We share our knowledge in, in two primary ways. We share our knowledge by publishing our results in peer-reviewed journals where fellow scientists review your work and, and, and view it to be acceptable and of high enough standard to go out into the literature. The second way we do that is we go to meetings where we talk about our work. And then there's really a third way that we're doing that quite effectively now, and that is um, we work in collaborative teams with people around the, around the world. Almost every project we have in our lab is a collaborative project with somebody else. This is the world famous lab of Dr. John Adams who moved this group here from Notre Dame. And a uh, really good colleague to have with all the people you have working in the lab. This is the really great thing is my lab works on malaria. His lab works on malaria. They work on slightly different things in malaria than we do, but the team of us together is really, really good. It's, we can bounce ideas off each other and uh, really make more advances than if we were here by ourselves. So it's a lot of fun to be able to have you know, such a great group of people as uh, the Adams lab to join us in this research. The advantage of doing collaborative research uh, is that you usually are able to work with individuals who enhance your ability to obtain research goals. And so his ability complements my ability uh, in terms of being able to translate basic science and research projects from sort of interesting observations into potential new products for antimalarial drugs control. Uh, again, part of that is because I am a major advocate for being multidisciplinary and, and trying to use new approaches and work with people that have different experiences and expertise. But the, ulti but the ultimate goal for a research team is to publish their, 
research in an internationally rep reputable journal so that everybody can read it, everybody can, because you never know who needs to see what you just did. The, the days are gone where a single person in a single lab can have the same impact on research because each little bit of knowledge we gain and we share with other people in our field sort of advances the whole field. So even if I, were, I or my group were to make a huge advance next month, next year, it's going to be built on the shoulders of others that have gone before us. Dr. Kyle was even kind enough to take us behind the scenes and show us his lab, which includes a variety of equipment, such as sub-zero and explosion-proof refrigerators, as well as many other safety features. So this is a typical biological safety level 2 laboratory where we have separated this room from the rest of the environment so that people can't just walk in. They have to be basically a member of the lab and know all the safety procedures to work in the lab. The air handling is such so that the room is at negative pressure so that it's all, I mean, positive pressure so that it's pulling air in instead of pushing air out in case something were to happen. But basically this is what the lab looks like inside. We have it doesn't really matter what you're studying as long as you have passion for it, you have the drive for it, you want to make this difference, you can study anything. And Dr. Kyle's research really showed that, you know, it doesn't matter who you are, it doesn't matter what you're doing, as long as you're, you want to do it and you're inspired to do it. And to see this difference that he's making has been really inspiring to me, who hasn't really considered research before, that I might consider research now. So what is it like working in Dr. Kyle's lab? It's, it's been good because he gives us uh, a lot of autonomy, so we uh, usually will he'll give us a general idea of what he wants to work on. Like for, for me, I, I kind of just did a bunch of projects for about a year, and he goes, this was good, this was bad, maybe we should focus on this. And so it's, it's, it's a good lab if you uh, are individually motivated. I'm the guy who and... tries to bring the money and keep the projects going, so okay. the fun part is what Brian gets to do. <laughs> I get to do all the paperwork. I don't think that there's ever an end goal to research because uh, there's so many more things I want to do now because of what I learned to get to this point. I think that's why research is exciting because you're never really finished. I hope to have an impact and and that you can align your research interests with something that's important.